Good morning. Wow. Morning. morning. Much better. My name is Peter Loge. I'm a, uh, the, exec the Vice President for External Relations here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I want to welcome all of you to this morning's session, uh, Preventing and Mitigating Conflict, Role of International Courts. The United States Institute of Peace is an independent, nonpartisan institution established by Congress to increase the nation's capacity to manage international conflict without violence. Our core mission is to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict around the world by engaging directly in conflict zones and providing analysis, education, and resources to those working for peace. Because of our prevention and mitigation mandate, we at USIP are very pleased this morning to join with our co-sponsors, the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, and the Hague Institute for Global Justice to host this important and unique dialogue featuring the prosecutor from the International Criminal Court and jurists from the International Court of Justice to discuss an underexamined aspect of international conflict management, the role of international courts in preventing and mitigating conflicts. I need to give a special thanks here, actually, to USIP Center for Gender and Peacebuilding, without which we would not be here this morning. And I'd like to personally thank Nicoletta Barbera for all of her work pulling together this important event. We're very pleased that this event is being held with the support of the Foreign Ministry of the Kingdom of the Netherlands and the American Bar Association's ICC project. The focus of the discussion will be on the role of the courts based in The Hague, the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court, in preventing and resolving conflicts and ensuring accountability for war crimes and in the contribution of women to peaceful settlement of disputes and strengthening the international rule of law. To introduce our panel and set the ground rules for the discussion, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Abby Williams as our moderator. Abby is a former vice president of USIP. Watching him come in this morning, it's clear he knows more people here than I do, actually, I believe. <laughs> and he now serves as the president of the Hague Institute for Global Justice. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Williams. Well, many thanks, Peter, for the introduction. Um, it's really a personal pleasure uh, for me to be back at USIP and to see so many uh, old colleagues and friends and to share the billing with three organizations with which I have close ties. Uh, I began my own academic career at Georgetown University as a professor and have been enormously impressed by the important work which the Georgetown Institute for Women Peace and Security has spearheaded since its establishment in 2011. I also, as Peter said, spent uh, um, four happy years here as Senior Vice President at USIP and in my new role as President of the Hague Institute for Global Justice, I have been delighted to work closely with the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs and particularly with the Royal Netherlands Embassy here in Washington, and I'm pleased to see H.P. Schweinmacher as the counselor of the embassy, uh, to realize our common aims in the fields of peace, justice, and security. Uh, the Hague is the international capital of peace and justice, but it is not a judicial center only because of the warm hospitality of the Netherlands and because of the fame of its storied institutions including the Peace Palace, which celebrated its centenary last year. Ultimately, The Hague's international reputation depends on the quality of the leaders, judges, lawyers, and diplomats that staff its unique constellation of international courts and tribunals. Uh, four of these leaders join us for this morning's discussion. And it is a particular honor to share the stage with these esteemed colleagues from The Hague. On behalf of all the convening organizations, I would like to bid them a warm welcome. Uh, Judge Joan Donahue was elected to the court in 2010, prior to which she served as principal deputy legal advisor to the US State Department across the street. Uh, she has also had a distinguished career as a professor, including at Georgetown and George Washington <coughs> uh, Universities. Judge Shui was elected to the court in 2010, prior to which she served as 
um, in senior legal and diplomatic posts in China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, these posts included Director General of the Department of Treaty Law, and she also served as Chinese ambassador uh, to the Netherlands. Um, Judge Julia Sebutinde was prior to joining the ICJ uh, in 2011, a judge at the Special Court of Sierra Leone. She joined the Special Court following an impressive career in Uganda, where she began her career in the Ministry of Justice and ultimately served as a High Court judge. And of course, the prosecutor uh, has had a distinguished career in her uh, native um, Gambia, rising to very senior judicial positions, and also served um, at the tribunal in Rwanda, and now holds the distinguished post as the uh, prosecutor of the International Criminal Court at The Hague. So it's a tremendous uh, honor for me to share the stage uh, with all of them. The format for this morning's discussion is as follows. I will begin by posing initial questions to the judges, uh, and the prosecutor designed to frame the conversation and to highlight critical challenges that the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court are currently facing. I will then provide an early opportunity for you, the members of the audience, to engage uh, in uh, the discussion. And I will take your questions uh, in groups of three to maximize uh, the conversation. So let me start off um, first with uh, Judge Donahue uh, and uh, the prosecutor. Uh, could you tell us a little about how the roles of the uh, International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court differ and how they each fit within the wider system of international law? Judge Donahue. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, thank you to you for moderating this event, to our hosts here at USIP, and to the Dutch government for sponsoring our trip. It's especially interesting to me to be sponsored in my own capital, where I lived for many years, by, a, by another government. And uh, I sort of see the, see the uh, world uh, foreign policy apparatus uh, for, through the lens of an institution that is not part of the United States and where my job is very decidedly not to represent the United States. Um, so w uh, we were chatting informally before about the fact that um, uh, because The Hague is the Center for Peace and Justice, there are multiple courts there and there are people who are expert in those courts and can immediately distinguish them, but uh, many people don't have that expertise, so we wanted to take some time at the beginning just to lay out what these courts are, what we each do. The common theme, I think, obviously, is these are institutions, the International Court of Justice for us and the International Criminal Court for the Prosecutor, that seek to achieve peace and justice, uh, but we do it in very different ways. Our court is the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. Um, we are nicknamed the World Court, and we had a predecessor court that was established under League of Nations auspices, but the court where we sit, the International Court of Justice in the Peace Palace, was set up um, as part of the United Nations apparatus after World War II. And we decide two kinds of cases. We decide contentious cases where one country brings a case against another country, and the question is about uh, whether that, whether the defendant country, if you will, has met its obligations under international law. And we also answer requests from other UN organs for advisory opinions on questions of international law. So neither of those functions involves a decision about whether an individual is accountable under criminal law. You'll hear more about that when the prosecutor talks. That, that is how our roles differ fundamentally. Other things you might want to know about our court, uh, there are 15 of us. We come from around the world, and traditionally, uh, uh, there is a practice of regional representation on the court. Um, the court is required to be representative in terms of the major legal systems of the world, and so you see that dimension as well. Um, the three of us are three of the 15 judges. We are the three women on the court now, and you see we look pretty diverse other than our, other than our gender. Um, uh, 
And our court does not automatically have jurisdiction over contentious cases. States have to consent in advance to our jurisdiction. They can do that generally. And at the moment, about a third of UN member states have done that, which means two thirds haven't. But in addition, they can consent to the court's jurisdiction in particular treaties. Uh, a treaty can have a provision that says, uh, the parties agree that if there is a dispute, uh, that dispute can be referred to the International Court of Justice for resolution. So many of the cases that come to our court come to us through that kind of a mechanism. And states, two states can also agree jointly to bring cases to us. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. I'll just tell you about two of our recent cases to give you a flavor. Um, our most recent judgment was in a case that Australia brought against Japan. Japan had a program of whaling in the Southern o Ocean, and it said that that whaling program was lawful because it was whaling for purposes of scientific research, which is allowed under the Whaling Convention. Australia's view was, no, it's unlawful. The court agreed with Australia and ordered Japan to end the program. Japan has said that it will do so. Uh, soon, earlier before that, we resolved a maritime boundary dispute between Chile and Peru. Uh, and in that case as well, the parties have quite recently announced that they have agreed to a coordinate so that uh, fill in the details on the boundary that we delimited. Uh, I'll stop there and turn it over to the prosecutor, but that's an overview of our, of our court. Yes, I, I think it's uh, extremely important that we draw this distinction at the very beginning because um, the, the confusion is uh, really everywhere. And uh, I note that wherever we go, we, we get called the International Court of Justice, you know, why um, are you doing, not uh, asking us questions relating to what you are doing <laughs> instead of what we are doing. And um, as the judge has said, the jurisdictions, of course, are, uh, are different. Um, you deal with mari um, uh, border disputes, you deal with maritime, you know, submitted by states. You know, ours is an individual criminal responsibility. You know, we deal with individuals. And our jurisdiction covers uh, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. You know, and um, this, even the way we, the, the jurisdiction of the ICC is triggered is uh, different. Uh, currently, the, the ICC can only intervene in territories of states' parties. That is, those who have signed and ratified the Rome Statute, or over. Um, nationals of, of states parties who commit these crimes. Um, and, and these <coughs> crimes, as I said, it's war crimes, crimes against humanity and, and, and genocide. And potentially the crime of aggression, but this will only happen after 2007. This may happen after 2007. Um, the ICC, as opposed to the uh, ICJ, which um, as you know, taking over from the Permanent Court of International Justice is a long time, long standing court, at least uh, long has a long history. But the ICC is a relatively young institution. It was only, um, as you know, uh, came into, was established in 2002 um, after the Rome Statute was signed in 1998 in Rome. Um, the ICC is a treaty based institution. It, it has currently 122 states that have signed and ratified the Rome Statute. It is not an organ of the United Nations as opposed to, uh, to the ICJ. It's a treaty-based uh, uh, institution. And as I said, even with the jurisdiction, the way the ICC can um, exercise its jurisdiction is where, as opposed to you, a state refers a situation to the ICC, requesting ICC's intervention, or where the United Nations Security Council, acting under Chapter 7 and also um, under, mandated under the Rome Statute to refer situations, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, to the ICC for investigations and prosecutions, like uh, um, it did in the case of Libya and also the, uh, in the case of Sudan, Darfur, the ICC's prosecutor can exercise juris jurisdiction. 
Again, I think one fundamental uh, distinction that we can talk about is the powers, the proprietor powers that has been given under the statute by, by uh, given to the prosecutor under the statute. And this powers means that if these crimes are taking place under the territory, in, on the territory of a state party, the ICC prosecutor by her own motion can intervene if that particular state is not already genuinely investigating and prosecuting. And this is uh, what happened in the situation in Kenya. You know, the primary responsibility to investigate and prosecute always remains with the state. But if that responsibility is not taken up by the state to investigate and prosecute genuinely, the ICC prosecutor can, can move in. So this, these are really the um, uh, fundamental differences that you, that you have between the ICJ, you know, being a, um, an, an arm, the judicial arm of the United Nations, and the ICC being an independent, international, treaty-based institution. Well, um, you've both, um, Judge Donahue and Madam Prosecutor, uh, mentioned the different jurisdictional basis for the work of both the ICJ and uh, the ICC. For example, in the case of the ICJ, you know, the voluntary consent of member states. And I was wondering whether Judge Shui um, could, whether you could reflect on how the jurisdictional challenges which both courts face, for example, the ICJ basis of voluntary submission of states to its jurisdiction, uh, and the ICC's lack of universal jurisdiction subject to the provisions of the Rome Statute, which the prosecutor has underlined, um, how both of these compare, and is it possible to make analogies between the strengths and the limitations of both? Uh, first of all, I, I think, can you hear me? My, that, that's my word. Uh, this microphone doesn't work. It's okay. Oh, okay. okay. If uh, uh, my voice fails me at the back, please just indicate. Uh, I try to speak as loud as possible. Um, first of all, regarding ICJ, indeed, ICJ's jurisprudence depends on the consent of the states. And as Judge Donahue introduced a moment ago, there are three types of bases for states to accept jurisdiction of the court. One, we call it Article 30 to uh, compulsory jurisdiction. The states declare it will accept jurisdiction beforehand to another state who has also accepted the same uh, jurisdiction of the court regarding certain international disputes. Second one is by international agreements. When certain agreement regarding the interpretation and application of that particular agreement at the request of the one, uh, one party that they can bring the case to the court. And the third type is the uh, agreement by the parties. And then you would say, suppose if states don't accept just in the court, does it weaken the role of ICJ? So far, there are 69 states who have made declaration to accept compulsory jurisdiction of the court. And many others have accepted jurisdiction of the court through agreements, bilateral or multilateral. And around uh, over 80 countries have appeared before the court in contentious cases. So, so far since the outside of the court, over 150 cases that have been brought before the court in contentious uh, dispute. And also uh, around uh, third, over 30 cases about uh, advisor opinions. I don't think that 
principle of consent is really a challenge to the court. Why so? First of all, we know, according to Article 33 of the Charter, there are various types of means, or, or various types of uh, uh, peaceful settlement means available to the states, from negotiation, good offices, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, then judicial settlement. What kind of mean will be suitable for state parties concerned to settle certain dispute? Very much to the states to decide. This is the first point. Second, is the question of states' trust in the third party settlement. If you look at the cases before the court, you could tell why some states are so ready to submit their cases to ICJ, why some states choose to have bilateral negotiations, maybe through the help of regional organization or certain kind of third party, but not a compulsory settlement by the court. So it's very much depend on the case. Then you would ask question, if that is the case, only 69 states that accept the compulsory jurisdiction of court, what's the role of the court as the principal judicial organ of the state? I would say, apart from the judgments itself, actually states, party or not, to the dispute, always attach great importance to the judgments of the court and particularly its jurisprudence. <coughs> For instance, I was negotiating with our neighbor, Vietnam, on the maritime delimitation case. In our negotiations, we often look at international principles, established uh, the, the, the cases and established maritime uh, principles from the court. So this is very important. <coughs> I, I would not at the beginning say it's really the weakness. I, I would say the, actually the court role uh, is much larger than people generally think. So it's not a simple matter of jurisdiction. Vis-a-vis -vis, uh, ICC, I think it's a little bit different from ICJ. It's really the, the, the forum that pursue, persecute individual criminal uh, responsibility. It's quite a different role. But in the whole framework of international law, uh, both have, this, uh, have their own role and both contribute to international peace and justice. Thank you. Well, uh, Madam Prosecutor, Judge Shui has um, suggested that the voluntary basis of the ICJ's jurisdiction um, is not fundamentally a, a weakness. How do you see the ICC's lack of universal jurisdiction? And do you have any thoughts uh, on her assessment of um, the basis of the ICJ's jurisdiction? Um, I think with respect to um jurisdiction. The, the strength of the ICC, I believe, it's in so many ways, it's also its limitations. Um, because it is an independent judicial institution, its strength, its legitimacy relies on applying our judicial mandate in an independent and impartial manner. I think that is the only way the ICC will be able to build its uh, credibility, always respecting the jurisdiction of the court and never going beyond the jurisdiction of the court. Um, as a lawyer, I strongly believe in the power of the law as a, as a tool and a tool to bring accountability to the perpetrate, for the perpetrators of these crimes, but also for the victims of, of these crimes. Um, I think the equalizing factor is that no one is above the law and that one standard should be applied to all. But the ICC operates, even though we're an independent judicial institution, we operate in uh, a political environment, an environment in which 
uh, there are many priorities for the, for the states sometimes in which we operate. And it is not always that the judicial uh, mandate is a priority for that state. So we, we, we operate in that, uh, and we suffer from the consequences of these political uh, priorities that we, we have in states. But the jurisdiction of the ICC, we, we also always should remind ourselves, is, depends a lot, the effectiveness, I, I should say, depends a lot on cooperation with states. Because this is how the ICC was created. The ICC was created to perform its judicial work and for the states who are parties to the Rome Statute to be the enforcing arm of the ICC. And it is only through that cooperation that we will be able to um, effectively function as a, as a judicial, judicial institution. Without that cooperation, we have difficulties in the, um, having uh, the rulings of the judges executed, having arrest warrants you know, executed on, on states, uh, on, on persons found in states parties or even elsewhere and brought before the court. And this is, as I said, a limitation for the court. Many, many always say, uh, you don't have a police force, you don't have an army, you know, so you, how can you function? How can you be effective? But I think the, the, the important aspect of this is to look at the role that the international community has decided to play in international criminal justice by creating this permanent independent international institution to do judicial work to prosecute crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. And by becoming state parties, undertaking, undertaking to execute the, the decisions that the court will take. I, I think this is very important. And this is why we always say that the, um, we did not create uh, a court. The Rome Statute did not create a court. It created a system, a system of international criminal justice in which the ICC will do its work and the states will be the enforcing arm um, of the government, of the, of, the, of, the, of the court. Indeed, universality is very important for the court. Because what we have uh, seen happening is that there is this double standard that has been created. You know, for those who are parties to the Rome Statute, uh, the Rome Statute is able to intervene and, and, and um, uh, uh, investigate and prosecute and bring justice for the victims of those uh, in, in, in states, member states. Whereas, on the other hand, non-member states are not able to, the victims of non-member states are not able to benefit from this, the intervention of the court, unless there is a UN Security Council referral, or perhaps there is a declaration by that state accepting ICC's jurisdiction. So it creates this uh, double standards in which the court is definitely not responsible for, but it is the system. And this is why universality is important that every state that is concerned about impunity should come on board. This is the hope, that they should come, board, come on board and become members of the ICC, become states parties, and I think that way the court will be able to be as effective as we wanted it to be in the first instance by eradicating everywhere where it happens impunity. Everywhere where these perpetrators commit these crimes will be held accountable, that there will be no safe haven anywhere. No one will be able to, to hide from uh, being held to account. I think the victims yearn for this day to come. Judge Sebetunde, I want to follow up on the point that the prosecutor mentioned about the challenges which the ICC has mm. to confront in deal working in a political environment, she put it. Um, would you say that the ICJ has a greater luxury than the ICC in operating in a less political environment? No, I wouldn't say so. I think there's actually remarkable resemblance or similarity. Both institutions were born or birthed out of a situation where um, the international community 
um, what was looking at, at, at a tragedy, a human tragedy that happened. In the case of the ICJ, the Second World War. In the case of the ICC, the two genocides that, that we're quite aware of, Rwanda and, um, and the Yugoslav genocide. And I think both courts were birthed out of a sense of duty that the international community had to come up with an apparatus. One, to deal with the impunity or to prevent the impunity. Um, or, and, and also to build uh, an apparatus whereby in future um, situations like uh, those would be averted. Um, unfortunately, I think when it comes to implementing on a case-by-case -case basis, that is where the rubber hits the road. And it's really where individual states have to rise up to the occasion and to be tested, um, those that, that either acceded to the, the Rome Statute or have accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of, of our court to see how they will enforce, at the end of the day, the judgments of the court. And I think both courts depend on the state's parties and on the international community to enforce the judgments. So when there's difficulty, when there's a, a grinding uh, of the teeth uh, in the implementation of the court's uh, judgments, then it's very easy to turn on the institutions and, and accuse them of ineffectiveness. But instead, I think that the international community ought to turn on itself and ask itself, why are these institutions that are our, our um, creations, why are they not functioning effectively? Now, the ICJ has been perhaps fortunate, perhaps because of its size, because of the fact that it's, it's the judicial organ of the UN, that its judgments are generally respected and enforced, sometimes begrudgingly, sometimes more begrudgingly than not. Um, and also, we're a bit more fortunate in that we do not depend on the state's parties uh, for investigations, which unfortunately the prosecutor has to depend upon. But I mean, all said and done, for me, the similarities I see is that these institutions are creatures of the international community and their well-being and efficiency depends on the international community that set them up. And so if they fail, or if there's any failing, any weakness in implementation, uh, I think it, it's a good thing to re-examine where in the international community has the weakness occurred. Judge Sebutunde, you, you mentioned the similar circumstances which gave uh, birth to both courts, the ICJ and, and the ICC. Uh, but of course, the the ICJ has been in existence for nearly 70 years now, and the ICC uh, for 10. And I was wondering, starting with you, and I'd like the views of the other judges as well, um, as to the extent to which you think the advent of the ICC has affected the jurisprudence of the ICJ. Starting with you, Judge Sebutunde. Okay, in the field, in the field of cases concerning genocide, for instance, and other human rights abuses. There is a, a kind of a, of a gray, or I wouldn't even call it a gray area, but an overlap, let me say. An interesting overlap um, between the, the roles of the two courts in that whilst the ICC, or whilst, let me start with the ICJ, whilst the ICJ may examine, for instance, whether state A, um, has breached its obligations under the Genocide Convention, if it happens to be signatory, um, it, it may look at a number of factors. Um, the prosecutor, on the other hand, uh, and, and not just the ICC prosecutor, but prosecutors in the um, ICTY, ICTR, have already dealt with the individuals, the individual players in the alleged genocide. And, uh, so the findings of the, the criminal tribunals at some stage will become relevant before the ICJ as part of the, the, the pieces of the puzzle that will determine whether factually genocide did happen in country A. Uh, but they will not help 
uh, those pieces will not help the court, the ICJ, determine whether the state, state A, was responsible for the genocide. So there's that in, in interesting overlap I found, especially in the field of, of human rights abuse, things like torture, um, things like um, mass murder and so on. Um, but of course these, apart from torture, there are these other things that are not governed by treaty. So they probably would be covered under customary international law. Uh, but definitely it's an interesting um, overlap between state responsibility on the one hand for these abuses and individual criminal responsibility on the other hand in the tribunals. Um, and I think this is an interesting overplay where um, the ICJ, uh, perhaps they could before the establishment of these courts, uh, ignore the judgments and findings of these courts, but not anymore. Uh, they are important findings that uh, have been, um, have been uh, uh, established by judges, international judges, after much inquiry, after much investigation, and, and often if the, the conflict is the same conflict that the ICJ is dealing with, this is already wheels that have been invented that we do not need to reinvent, although we need to carefully look at what kind of findings were made, in what context were they made, and uh, many other things before we will, we will apply uh, or be persuaded uh, by the findings of the other court. But we do, we do work in tandem. Mm -hmm. Judge Chui, your views on Can, can this? I take a, a little bit different approach? Uh, I will start with the ICC. Uh, nowadays, uh, international lawyers tend to say, oh, uh, criticize ICC for being not uh, as effective as is desired. I would say from international law perspective, we cannot look at ICC in isolation. It's only a continuation. If you look at the cause of ICC, you have to see human rights cause. Where human rights cause started? Not today, <coughs> not after Cold War. If you trace international humanitarian law, long, long before, right? And uh, if you talk about the International Criminal Court, at least you would think of the Nuremberg Tribunal. We succeed a lot of the principles from there, from Tokyo Military Tribunal. So this is only a revival. It's a part of the human rights cause for the protection of victims of war, victims of serious international crimes. As a permanent institution for International Criminal Court, certainly the beginning would not be easy. Because in light of current state of international affairs, in light of current state of states, certainly it will encounter a lot of challenges. And this is what we are working for. But for ICJ, it's a different institution. But it's part of international law framework. Its task is to settle disputes between states, not only focus on human rights. But human rights is part of its work. For instance, we have cases relating to the application, interpretation, application of international conventions on torture, on genocide, and in many others. We promote the cause simply from different angles. Thank you. Judge Donahue? Um, you know, I was thinking about the title of this panel. It's uh, Preventing and Mitigating Conflicts, the Role of International Courts. And you've heard a bit about our work. And if you think about it, in both cases, a significant amount of our work is backward looking. So in both cases, the day-to-day the -day work of the institution is to look at a problem that has already occurred, and in our case, to decide on questions that one state brings with a claim of a breach <coughs> of law against the other state. And in the ICC, a question about whether a particular individual is accountable for certain kinds of crimes that are allegedly committed. So you could say, 
hmm, that doesn't sound like it has much to do at all with preventing and mitigating conflicts. By the time these two institutions come along, the conflict has already occurred. And it's important to think about that. We don't control our inbox at all. Uh, so states decide what cases to bring to us. So if we see a conflict out there and we as individuals think, oh, that's terrible, we're really worried about it, your institution can set up a group to try to intervene. Uh, other actors can get into the action. We can only watch. However, in both cases, and this is important, these institutions do more and contribute more, we hope, than simply settling those specific disputes. The prosecutor referred to the idea that the Rome Statute set up a system. And if you look more generally at the international legal system, the first thing you have to say about it is there's no boss. It's an incredibly disorderly, disorganized system. There's no CEO of the system. But the whole system has to be understood by looking at all the players in it. Our jurisprudence, we hope, uh, influences the behavior of states. People often talk about uh, the, the fact that states operate in the shadow of ICJ decision making. And, and it, it is not only a shadow that is relevant to the states that have consented to our jurisdiction. On Judge Shui's point about uh, compulsory jurisdiction earlier, while the judges were speaking, I took a quick look at our uh, recent cases. And I just wanted to point out, of the 10 most recent decisions we've rendered, only three of those were cases in which the jurisdictional basis was the general acceptance of compulsory jurisdiction. Uh, most of our cases come to us through other means. And I thought it was worthy of mentioning that. So think of it as a system, a chaotic system, but where um, our day-to-day -day work of looking back, we hope, also influences uh, the mitigation and prevention of disputes by articulating norms that are forward-looking and by dialing down the temperature on the kinds of disputes that we get. If we settle a dispute about a, when you hear the expression border skirmish, it means people are getting killed in some border area. If we can settle the boundary peacefully and the two states can then work to implement it, that can dial back the kinds of tensions that can potentially escalate and find their way into the ICC. So they're all pieces that need to be tied together. Mm -hmm. Prosecutor Ben Suda, let me follow up on that point with Judge um, Donahue has made about the preventive role uh, of the court, the ICJ in particular, and that it's not just backward looking mm -hmm. in its work. Um, in an op-ed um, last year, mm -hmm. I think it was still called the International Herald Tribune <laughs> at the time, uh, you used a phrase um, which Judge Donahue mentioned where you spoke about the long shadow of the court, uh, its preventive role, and its capacity to diffuse potentially tense situations that could lead to violence by setting, you said, a clear line of accountability. Yeah. How does the ICC work to fulfill this role? And is it in tension, uh, for example, with a growing controversy over the ICC's role in Africa? Um, I think prosecuting these crimes, these international crimes, should be seen as both as satisfying conceptions of retribution, but also as a means to prevent, to prevent the, the perpetration of crimes. And I think that the very knowledge that of the existence of this enforceable law and the fact that it is applied consistently, it is applied independently and systematically, can really act as a deterrent. For, for, for violators and also to stop even would-be violators from committing these crimes. I mean, we've seen this uh, being confirmed by uh, academic empirical work, but also from our very own experience, we have seen that this uh, um, is, uh, can act as a deterrent. And I would just like to give a couple of examples. Uh, but first of all, to say that we should not look at the ICC court, its successes, its challenges, um, whether it is going to deter or not, just by the, um, what is happening in court, or by the number of convictions, and, or by the number of acquittals. I think the impact of the court, as I said in that article, is really what we want to call, borrowing from the words of uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, the shadow of the court the impact that the court has or is already having in the international 
uh, arena. Um, I believe that the ICC has already become a relevant player in the international arena. And to give the example of Lubanga, Lubanga is our first case. Uh, and it is a case that we brought charges against Thomas Lubanga, DILO, for conscripting and enlisting children and using them to actively participate in hostilities, children below the age of 15. But even before the end of the Lubanga trial, we see, for instance, the, the, the former SRSG for Children and Armed Con Conflict, Radhika, using this as a potential to factor in when she does her negotiations for the demobilization of children. And in fact, she did report to the court, you know, when, when, when she came, that she was able to use the Lubanga case to get Nepal to demobilize 3,000 children, children below the, the age of 15. And also that in all of her negotiations, whether it is with heads of states, governments, or whether it is with heads of militia, she uses the example of the Lubanga trial to, to, to convince them to, to demobilize these children. So I think this is, this is the impact. Because not only does the, the decisions or the cases that happen in court reflect in 122 states of the Rome Statute today, but as you can see, Nepal is a non-state party. So even in, in, in other countries and who are not parties to the Rome Statute, the impact is being felt there. She did report also that it has triggered, the Lubanga case has triggered debates you know, in, in various countries that are not even part of the Rome Statute. So I think this is what we look at. This is the impact. The other example that I can, I can give now is um, in the Kenya cases. This is, these are cases that we are receiving tremendous challenges you know, in prosecuting them, but I think we need to see, look at the impact that the, the, the fact that ICC is intervening in Kenya has played in the last elections of 2013. Ken Kenya is a country, we all know, that for the past 21 years, all the elections that took place are marred by various degrees of violence. But certainly, this did not happen in 2013, and I'm not saying that nothing happened, but I think it was <coughs> Compared to what was happening, certainly compared to 2007, 2008, what happened in 2013 uh, was, you can call it scuffles. It's, it's really not uh, um, what, what used to happen. And I always say that I don't claim that it is the ICC that is solely responsible for that. But I believe that certainly the fact that ICC has intervened in Kenya has played a role. In, in, in for the violence not to escalate in the 2013 um, uh, elections. Cote d'Ivoire, in 2004, we know that Cote d'Ivoire was heading also to serious post-election violence. And the, the, the former SRSG, Juan Mendes also, came publicly to talk about, to warn about the ICC, especially those who are giving hate speeches you know, on the radios and, and inciting people to go into violence. And I think that that warning of ICC's intervention has de-escalated the violence that could have taken place, at least uh, for a couple of years. So for me, this is the, the impact. This is the shadow that the court has. This is what we should be looking at. We shouldn't be looking, we shouldn't be judging ICC's successes or ICC's uh, um, uh, failures just by what happens in the, in the courtroom. I think the impact is, is important. But coming to the IC, <laughs> Africa bias, as they say, I mean, I, I mean, this comes all the time. You know, I, I get this question all the time on the continent, even outside of the continent. It is always said that uh, ICC is uh, focusing only on Africa and not elsewhere. And I think this is unfortunate. Really, it is unfortunate that uh, we should think uh, ICC is doing that. Because what we are forgetting today is that Africa has demonstrated a need and a support 
for the ICC, but also has demonstrated leadership in, account in advancing accountability on the continent. And I'm not saying these statements lightly. I think if we step back and go and, and look at the establishment of the court, how did the court become established? And I want to say, and I think all of those who are involved in the negotiations of the Rome Statute will know that Africa played a big role for this court to be established. Africa then showed the need for this court, the ICC, to be established. And we all know that the first state to ratify the Rome Statute is Senegal, an African state. We also know that today, the largest block, the lar largest number of countries in any regional block is from Africa. 34 states in Africa have ratified the Rome Statute. And I also say that if it had not been for Africa and African states, probably the ICC will start work. Obviously, we will start work, but we would not perhaps have started it as soon as we did. Because the first referrals requesting for ICC's intervention came from African states. Uganda, Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, Cote d'Ivoire, and as recent as last year, Mali requested the intervention of the ICC. Which, by the way, I just want to highlight that it is not ICC that is going to Africa. It is actually Africa that is coming to the ICC, that is requesting ICC's intervention. And those who talk about this, uh, uh, make these criticisms against the ICC, completely ignore the facts. They ignore the facts that this is what is happening and not the, not the other way around. The Kampala conference was held in Uganda in 2010 in an African state and where the um, crime, of adopt, uh, crime of aggression was, was adopted. That's another African state showing, showing leadership. So this, this um, accusation, you know, that ICC is uh, targeting Africa is, is completely wrong. I think we should be honest. We should look at uh, what Africa is doing currently. Yes, we do have difficulties at the moment. We have um, disagreements here and there. But I just want to say that the largest part of the requests for assistance that we make as an office goes to African states. And in fact, I, would, I can say that over 70% of those requests com comes back positive. You know, so it is, it is not that Africa has completely shut down against the ICC. We work with them every day. We make missions every day. We make requests for assistance every day. And uh, uh, this, is, this is important to show that Africa is showing need, is showing support, but it's also showing um, taking leadership in the advancement of international criminal justice. Well, in that spirit, let me move beyond Africa to two current situations, Syria and the Crimea. And the newspapers are filled with stories about what is going on in those two places. And we see a diversity of views on the uh, applicable international law. But neither the ICC nor the ICJ is playing any role in respect of either matter. Does this suggest that these courts have nothing to contribute when the stakes are especially high and when the international community is uh, sharp, sharply divided and you have various invocations of international law? Judge Sebutunde, do you want to start? Oh, I, was, I was hoping you wouldn't start with me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I have my personal views um, and I think uh, personally, I, before I look at the courts, I always want to look at the international community. I want to look to New York. I want to look at the Security Council and sort of say, guys, what are you doing? We're, 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 we're facing fire here. What are you doing? But as, 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 as Joan said earlier, these are situations that we in the court are individually watching with interest but unless and until we're seized with an actual um, case in, in either of the situations, we can only watch. Just like any other uh, court, 
would, 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 would just watch. Um, I, I cannot speak for the ICC because I, I, I don't know what would happen there. Um, but surely, in, in, in the, the apparatus that the international community has put up, we're just one player. The ICJ is one player uh, to, to settle disputes. And uh, we settle where the states allow us to do that. Um, we're like a clinic, if you like, where the patient has to come to the clinic to be treated. Um, I think the Security Council has a large um, part to play. I have my own views as to whether or not they've let us all down, uh, which I would not care to express here. Well, please um, do. No. <laughs> <laughs> And, 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 you know, I, I, I pull my hair, what's left of it, every day, just, just, just wondering. Um, but, you know, states are, are strange animals. And if we're to all peacefully coexist and to move forward into the next decade and the next uh, century and so on, we move, but we move very slowly. And whoever came up with this idea of a security council, it's, it's combination, the idea of veto powers. I don't know who came up with it. I don't know that it works, but I don't like it. I can tell you that much. Um, but I have no better solutions. But as, as a member of the court sitting, maybe I'm glad I'm not a member of the Security Council. It's much easier for me to sit and criticize the Security Council. It's much easier when the case is referred to the court for me to then sit in the quietness of my chamber and to try to figure out where the pieces of the puzzle fit in to give a judgment and to leave it to the states to implement or not to implement. Um, but definitely these, these are uh, hot issues on the table um, for which you cannot look like, like a worm at one institution and say, you guys are ineffective. You've got to have a bird's eye view where some of these conflicts are co um, concerned and to see uh, with, 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 a bird's, with a bird's eyes, if, if, if you like, as to where you think the solution could lie. Okay. Judge Donahue? Well, um, it's a good question and worthy of reflection. Um, and here I'll uh, play devil's advocate a bit with uh, what Judge Shui said earlier about the effect on our court of the limited acceptance of compulsory jurisdiction. To critics of our, the, our court's effectiveness often point to the fact that, if you will, two-thirds of member states have not accepted compulsory jurisdiction. Okay. Now, if there's any kind of a dispute and a state that considers itself aggrieved is trying to figure out uh, what should we do about this problem? Uh, having been a foreign ministry lawyer, I can say what they do is they develop a set of options. And they may look to see, is there a court that would have jurisdiction over, over this case? Can we bring uh, this case to a court? Um, and it is, the, it is true that uh, some of the largest and most powerful states have avoided uh, ICJ jurisdiction. And that creates a limitation. Um, it doesn't mean that any of us could say sitting here there would never be jurisdiction over a case A or a case, case B. That's a question we would only decide if the case were brought to us. Um, the United States has actually appeared before the International Court of Justice more than any other state, um, but has in recent years limited its exposure to jurisdiction. And so that would suggest that one wouldn't see the US in, before our court as frequently in the future. Um, so I think that. Um, it, it can leave a feeling of frustration when one looks at disputes and says, why aren't they in our court? Um, uh, sometimes that is a consequence of a judgment of an aggrieved state that our court wouldn't have jurisdiction. Uh, and sometimes it is simply the case that the, the judgment of an affected state or, or both of the affected states separately or collectively is that the best way to make progress to achieve their objectives, what they see in their national interest, is not to come to a court for resolution, but to pursue, to pursue other avenues. It's a complicated question, an important one. There is nothing in principle that precludes those kinds of hot conflicts uh, of being brought to our court. Um, our court has jurisdiction in principle to settle any cases arising under international law from anywhere in the world. But the state that brings the case to us has to establish a basis for the court's jurisdiction. Judge Shui? 
Uh, I'm glad I'm no longer the legal advisor in foreign ministry. When I face this question as a member of the court, I, I think uh, I may put the question in a better perspective, more objectively. Uh, first of all, I, I agree with both of my colleagues. The court has this jurisdictional limitation. Unless it's given, it's asked to pronounce is uh, legal position, either in a contentious case or advice opinion case, it cannot take the initiative to give its views on any contemporary issues. This is the first point. Second one, as in uh, at national front for judiciary, there's always a question of non-judiciability. Or we, and the American Constitution, the question of a, a, poli a political issue. Uh, for such hot issues like uh, Syria or Crimea, uh, we have to consider whether the case is arrived for judicial settlement, whether it's really a legal issue at this stage. I agree with Judge uh, Subtendi. Perhaps the uh, Security Council, at the moment, UN is the, the best forum, forum to discuss the matter. And because at the end of the day, it's not that everybody wants to seek legal view on the matter. All we want is a peaceful settlement between the parties either for Syria or for Crimea, for Ukraine, is the international community's common task to see whether we can find a proper solution to settle the dispute for the benefit of Ukraine people, for the region, and for the world. So this is a common task for all of us. So when you talk about effectiveness of international law, it doesn't mean only when the court can apply the law, so the law is effective. It's the states, the international community, the legal community, you have to think of the matter. Where international law lies. And I'm glad that this institution is not only about international, you are from different disciplines. This multi-discipline approach would be a better solution. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I'd now like to give an opportunity, as I said, to you, the members of the audience. I think you should clarify about ICC and Syria. Oh, ah, um, the prosecutor, before I give you an opportunity to engage in the discussion and the see there are two mics, uh, the prosecutor said that she wants to clarify the role of the ICC and Syria, which I think would be quite opposite. Madam yes. Prosecutor? Yes, because I think um, we, our court gets more called on <laughs> to intervene than even the, the, the ICJ in view of the, um, all the crimes that are uh, allegedly taking place in Syria. Um, it is thought that ICC should intervene. But I think I just want to clarify that, as I said at the very beginning, ICC can only intervene on the territories of state parties, which Syria is not, or uh, Ukraine, for that matter. So we, we, we cannot intervene, or over nationals of state parties, which also is not the case here. Um, I think the only other, uh, not, not I think, but according to the statute, the only other way in, ICC, in which ICC's jurisdiction can come into play is if any state that is not a party, but once ICC's jurisdiction decides to make a declaration under Article 12.3, as um, accepting ICC's jurisdiction and requesting for intervention. That's one way. The other way is if the United Nations Security Council were to make a resolution referring the situation to the ICC as, as is uh, uh, mandated under the statute. Which even in that case, it doesn't mean automatic intervention by the ICC, because we have to look at the facts 
and see that we, if we do act, we are acting within the legal framework of the Rome Statute before the, um, the, the, the ICC can intervene. So in this particular case, I know that uh, every time we get asked, why are you not intervening? Why, is, uh, why do you concentrate on Africa and you are not concerned about the victims in Syria? But this is not the instance. As I said, it is a matter of jurisdictional limitations. This is why the, the, um, the ICC cannot intervene. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor, for that clarification. Uh, now let's um, take some questions. I see the we have roving mics, and as I said, I'll take the questions in groups of three to maximize the discussion. Start with the lady closest to the mic. And if you give your name and institutional affiliation, that will be helpful. Hi, um, I'm Tolo Dukoya. I'm from American University, doing an LLM in criminal law and politics and legislation. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, my name is Tolu Odukoya. I'm from American University in Washington, D.C. here, and I'm doing an LLM in criminal law and politics and legislation. So my question is, for the ICC, when you ask states, when you see the states are investigating, what system do you have in place to confirm what they report to you as the report of the investigation? And in case those situations re-arise, what do you do? Do you, can you re-instruct the state to do another set of investigations or do you wait to see what steps they take and then step in? Okay, thank you. Do we have and the lady in red? Thank you. Um, my name is Zora Rosek. I'm uh, uh, director of uh, Global Watch Group and uh, former advisor to, on human rights to Afghan Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The question I have is Afghanistan has been um, a member uh, at least the last that I was at the foreign ministry a couple of years ago in Afghanistan, um, the uh, Rome Statute was signed. Now, since then, many um, violations and crime, crimes against um, humanity uh, has happened in Afghanistan, specifically by the group called Taliban, uh, what is the role of ICC in actually as a member state in bringing uh, these perpetrators into justice? Thank you. Thank you. And I think go to that side of the room. Hi, my name's Carolyn. I'm a, a student at the School for Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. My question is um, relating to the mandates of the the courts. The ICTR had a specific mandate to contribute to a reconciliation in Rwanda, and the ICC has a more general mandate to contribute to peace and security. I was wondering what kind of outreach um, the courts have to help promote reconciliation, or if there's any NGO partners that you work with to help promote those missions. Thank you. But it seems as if we have three questions um, directed to, to the prosecutor. Yes. So hopefully we'll have a more balanced <laughs> range of questions in the second round. Madam, Madam Prosecutor? Yeah, I hope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the first question um, concerns complementarity. As you know, one of the uh, principles enshrined in the Rome Statute is the um, principle of complementarity which means that national systems retain the responsibility to investigate and prosecute crimes. It is only when they are, not, they are, when they are unable to do so, you know, genuinely, or when they are unwilling to do so, that the ICC, by being members of the ICC, the ICC steps in. And we have been trying to um, uh, ensure that the, the, the principle of complementarity works through our own policy of even positive complementarity. Um, in your particular question, I, I prob probably it would be better answered if I give you examples. Uh, in Guinea, Guinea is a, a state party to the Rome Statute. It has ratified the Rome Statute uh, for some time now. But in 2008, 2009, you know, there were this uh, stadium, 
how, how would I call it? It's, it's not a conflict. But there was attack against civilians at the stadium when they attempted to demonstrate. And uh, potentially, crimes against humanity were committed. So the ICC, we decided to open preliminary examinations in Guinea, as we have done in uh, Colombia, as we have done in Afghanistan. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just take uh, the, those three questions together. And under preliminary examinations, we, we, we assess. We assess whether that, the, first of all, whether our crimes have been committed, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. We also assess whether that particular state is investigating and prosecuting the crimes, in the absence of which, if that is not happening, we, we, the, potentially ICC would intervene. But also, we assessed whether it would be in the interest of justice for the intervention of ICC. You know, if, whether it would not be against the interest of justice if we were to intervene in those uh, situations. And in Guinea, it has been under preliminary examinations for four years now. You know, and we are working closely with them. We are attempting to get uh, partners who will assist them. Because sometimes it's not always a question of unwillingness. Sometimes it's lack of capacity. And this is when, where I'm still calling on states that we need to think about ways in which we can assist those countries who may be willing to investigate and prosecute but lack the capacity. In the case of Ag Afghanistan, it is under preliminary examination. In, in fact, for, a, for some time now, I believe 2005 to now, if I'm not uh, mistaken. It's under preliminary examinations, and we are checking these, these, um, uh, all these aspects, whether you know, uh, uh, the crimes are taking place and whether anything is being done to address them. But the problem we have been having in our preliminary examinations in Afghanistan is security. You know, security not only for those people who we meet, because we have an obligation to protect them, but also security for our staff in deploying to the field. We have been attempting to go, we've been making requests, but notwithstanding, we have been collecting information, you know, which the office is analyzing, because we have to analyze and make sure that this criteria, all this criteria is met before we can even go to a next phase, or even decide to ask for authorization from the chamber to open investigations. Um, I think the, the, the last question is about uh, what, kind of, what kind of outreach. Um, as, as you know, NGOs have played uh, an important role in the establishment of the ICC, uh, a very important role. And I think we, we still continue to, to work with NGOs. We also work, work with states parties, we work with civil society um, for outreach. We realize now that outreach is, okay, we realized before, but even now, more now, more so now, especially when we have all this propaganda against the court. We realize that it is crucially important to, 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 good, to have a good structure in which we can do um, effective outreach. Because one thing that harms the court, that is harming the court, is this misperception, this misinformation that keeps going around about the ICC, which, as I said earlier on in my intervention, that if you look at the facts, it's not, it is not the case. But I think it's important that, especially in situation countries, those who are affected by these crimes know what to expect. It is important. But, and also, even outside of the situation countries, I think it is important for people to understand what the limitations of the court is. You know, where the court can intervene and where the court cannot intervene. As you know, in the, at the International Criminal Court, Criminal court, we have victim participation. You know, we have victim participation for those who are affected by, by the crimes that the ICC is trying. And it's absolutely crucial that those victims also know that this, this is what they should expect. At the ICC, we have the Office of the Public Counsel for Victims. You know, that uh, um, goes to the situation countries and try to reach out to the victims, to, to, to speak to them and tell them their expectations. Also, we have the, what is known as the PIDs, 
you know, it's, it's our public information unit for the whole of the ICC. But the, definitely, it is important to have additional resources for the pits to be able to do its work properly. I mean, it's a small number of staff, but we have seen last year, we have seen what is, what is happening in the media, we have seen what is happening in Kenya, which the ICC alone cannot match. You know, we cannot, it's, it's, it's a reality. And we've been talking to states, we've been looking for assistance, we've been talking to civil society to see what we can put in place so that the outreach that is necessary for the effectiveness of the court is, is there. Well, in the interest of judicial fairness, I want to give a preference in the second round to questions which are either uh, aimed directly at the judges of the International Court of Just Justice or a question which both the prosecutor and the judges in the ICJ could address for the second round. Chantal Dion Udrat. Thank you, Abby. I'm Chantal Jung Artat with CIPRI North America and Women in International Security, also known as WISE. I have indeed a question for the judges. And my question is how do you see has the ICG evolved over time, both in terms of the types of cases that you have seen coming in front of the court, as well as the ratio of judgment versus advisory opinions? And a second question, if I may, is both courts, uh, a lot of states have not signed on to these courts. And so what can you do or what should one do to beef up uh, the states adhering or signing on to either the statutes or the court? Um, and maybe for Judge Xi, uh, it seems to me that China has been very critical of the ICC, and I wonder if you could uh, explain the objections of China. Okay, thank you. Let's go to that. Hi, I'm Robert Lord. I'm a master's candidate at American University uh, studying transitional justice and, and specifically genocide prevention and punishment. Um, I have a question for all of the, all of the panelists. Um, uh, in the Bosnia v. Serbia decision at the ICJ, uh, there was uh, a very narrow uh, conception of the effective control test and a very narrow uh, delineation of the actual occurrence of genocide to three days in July at Srebrenica. Um, does, was, when, in making those decisions, uh, which were relatively conservative decisions, uh, was the court, uh, in a sense, uh, making a political calculation to uh, enhance its legitimacy in, in, certain, in certain contexts, um, did those calculations uh, have a political aspect generally? And, and, and more specifically, I guess, for the prosecutor and as well as the judges, um, uh, is there a need uh, with such a nascent court at the ICC to uh, preserve or perpetuate the, that such a nascent institution um, by making calculations that may have political aspects? Thank you. Good. And let's stay on this side and third question. Good morning. My name is Larissa Mihalisko with the Department of State. Um, I, my question is for, for all the panelists. Um, of course, the topic today is about how the courts mitigate and prevent justice. But in some instances, states may use uh, criminal tribunals, for example, um, to actually inflame problems in their own countries. And the, the um, example that comes to mind is Bangladesh. Um, and I was wondering, maybe you could provide some, uh, some guidance or some uh, yeah, guidance really for practitioners of how to encourage states not to overly politicize uh, criminal tribunals as well as um, cases that go to court. Well, a range of questions. Thank you. Judge Donahue, why don't we start with you? Um. Well, I think I'll, I'll just uh, touch on the, uh, an aspect of the last question, uh, speaking of courts that resolve disputes um, uh, between states like ours. Um, and I would question the phrase overly politicized. And essentially, um, I would say uh, the kinds of disputes that come to our court are always political. Uh, and um, uh, think about it this way. Uh, let's say you've got a question about who owns an island, state A or state B. It looks really technical. The legal aspects are really technical. But do you want to be the leader in a state that's been claiming in all kinds of speeches for years and years, that's our island, it doesn't belong to the neighbor. Do you want to be the leader who 
gives that island to the other state? Maybe not. So uh, one reason why you might actually want that dispute to go into our process is to manage your domestic political issue. How do I uh, get reelected? Well, giving away our island might not be a good idea. So uh, having this ca case settled by the ICJ or another tribunal might be a different approach. I think um, many of the disputes that find their way to our court are nested within a broader, inevitably political dispute. Uh, sometimes it has a domestic, domestic political dimension, as in my example, but usually we think about the bigger disputes between the two states, the broader disputes within a state, maybe uh, ethnic tensions, etc. So our, our cases, we settle legal disputes, but they're always nested within bigger, uh, weighty political disputes, inevitably. Um, Judge Shui? It's a uh, question more directed to me uh, as to chi China's practice. Uh, first of all, I would say um, for ICJ, there are only about uh, 69 countries that accept compulsory Jewish and Article 60, uh, 36, Paragraph 2 of the statute. And many countries have not yet so how you see the involvement of the court. Uh, I would say actually as international lawyer, when we think about the third party settlement, we have to look at the history of the court. Third party settlement, actually if you compare the history of international law, only came very recently. And if you look at arbitration, the first arbitration Alabama case, only in the middle of the 19th century. And if you look at the permanent court, and then and the, the League of Nations, and later and the UN, the, 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 the principal judicial organ of the, the, the organization, still you have to see why so many states have a reservation regarding third party settlement this first point. Second, after uh, having worked in the court for nearly four years from inside, I can now better appreciate why some states do not come to the court to submit their dispute to the <coughs> organ uh, for third party settlement. This is the organ very different from other organs of the United Nations, with, where the court works in two languages, English and the French. And it also carried very much the practice of common law and civil law, the major two forms legal system in the world, very much by the Anglo-Saxon and Francophone practice. And even if under the statute, judges are elected from different or major forms of legal system and civilization, still, when states decide to come to the court for certified settlement, they have to, you know, at least a certain confidence and certainty that the court would deliver judgment that it can accept. So, all this background explained the hesitation on part of states why they do not come. Now the question relating to the political aspect. I agree with just on the view. Each case has its political element. And uh, oftentimes, if you look at the cases with territorial dispute, you can easily tell because the domestic pressure <coughs> for boundary issues, for territory issues, they cannot settle through negotiations. So they have to come to third party settlement. This is one thing. Secondly, about a Bosnia uh, versus a Serbia case, uh, so happened Neither of the three judges were present on the bench when the case was conceded and the judgment was delivered. 
I, I wouldn't call it the judgment as a conservative. You have to distinguish state responsibility for violations of international convention from cases of individual criminal responsibility. I have to say, as a reader of the judgment, I think the court has given uh, quite a sufficient consideration of the legal and the factual funding of ICTY, especially in case of Supernisa. But when you interpret the convention on genocide, the court has to really follow the Vienna Convention on Local Treaties, the rules of interpretation. So that, that's the result. Now come to the question of China's attitude or criticism of ICC. Indeed, even China has taken active part in the uh, consideration and the conclusion of Roman statute from day one, and still an uh, observer of the convention. It has been quite critical about uh, uh, the court, simply because of this African element. And actually, I, I just want to take this opportunity to ask Madame Persecutor a question. <coughs> At African Union, actually, the leaders of African uh, leaders made a joint declaration uh, on the uh, on ICC's work for focusing primarily on African leaders. And if the court go on, you know, goes on like this, focusing on African <coughs> leaders, and we may ask ourselves whether this kind of a persecution uh, really indeed contribute stability and peace of the region. And this is, I think, uh, the China's major concern. You may say, some of the referrals are voluntary referrals from African country. But we can't see a court. The Western country provided judges and the lawyers. The African country prevented defenders. What kind of justice that could be? Right? It doesn't mean up to now, in the past 10 years, only African countries, leaders, <coughs> violate international law. There are no other commitment uh, offenses of serious international crime. Why those cases are not referred to ICC? I think these are legitimate questions. If we really care about ICC, really care about international criminal law, criminal justice, we have to think this seriously. So far, China is outside the statute, Roman statute, but it really wish all the success of this international endeavor and be persuaded to join it. So, um, but at the end of uh, my speech, I think it's a, a, it's a break to do a little bit of promotion of The Hague. <laughs> Uh, ICJ is the longest uh, permanent court in, in The Hague, in the Peace Palace. But nowadays, every international lawyer referred to ICC. But uh, I have to say this is a success of The Hague. So uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, as a center of international law, uh, the Dutch government really has made a great contribution. I want to take this opportunity to make that acknowledgement. Thank you. Okay. Judge Subt Yes, maybe um, I'll endorse everything my, my uh, colleagues have said, uh, but maybe a word on, on the, the interesting question that, that somebody asked about, why do states politicize uh, criminal courts and what can be done to discourage this? Um, states are political animals <laughs> and they will politicize anything to suit themselves. Uh, in, in the case um, of Africa, and forgive me if I also speak about Africa, but um, I've had the privilege of serving in another criminal tribunal and uh, where we were trying 
a former head of state, and that didn't sit very well with a number of people. For me, the way I see it is uh, th there's a bit of a double standards where, in the case of the ICC, the indictee is not a head of state or former head of state, is just an ordinary person. That is okay. Nobody has a quarrel with that. But as soon as the indictee has some kind of political standing in, in, in their community, then that is a, a problem. These are the double standards that I see and I have a problem with. Um, the, the Rome Statute is very clear um, in saying that the, the political standing of a person shall not be used as a defense against an indictment. And when member states sign on such a treaty, they absolutely undertake uh, to abide by that provision and to say, well, it doesn't matter, come what may, if it's a head of state, you are not above the law, so to speak. So for it to now become a problem after the event, uh, for me, I think is very, very unfortunate. And I, for one, take the opportunity whenever it arises like this to try and put things in perspective to say, um, as, as the prosecutor has belabored, <coughs> examine the cases on each one's case's merits. Do not generalize. It's very easy to say the institution is being faulted because it's looking at one continent, and therefore it must be persecuting. Look at who's making the accusation in respect of which indictees um, and how did the referral, how was the referral made? And examine each case on the facts. But unfortunately, the majority of our people, even lawyers, educated people, do not care to examine the facts. And they just carry the torch of criticism. And, and it's a very dis disruptive, very destructive kind of attitude that can destroy an otherwise good, well-intended institution, such that instead of this institution being nurtured and being effective and being allowed to, um, to perform the duties for which it was birthed, it's instead torn down, bruised, battered, and broken. And for me, I, I see this as an issue of, of impunity by another name, this attack, on the, on, on the court, um, even the, the idea of, of another ad hoc tribunal being politicized, of course there, there will always be some state or other wanting to politicize and control uh, the system. And for some countries, um, some are more prone to controlling the judiciary than others, unfortunately. But I think the challenge is for the judges, the prosecutors in those courts to stand up and be independent and work as independently as possible and deliver the judgments as they should. Let me just give uh, the final word to the prosecutor. Um, first of all, on, I think I talked about um, earlier on uh, the issue of politicization. I believe I mentioned it because this is one of the challenges that the ICC faces today. Um, ICC's decisions are politicized. You know, our interventions are politicized, of course, not by the ICC, but those who want to do that. And I always say that this is one area that we, as officials, I, as prosecutor, cannot go into, will never go into, will not even contemplate of going into. I've always said that the considerations I have for opening a case, for bringing prosecutions, for closing a case, for opening preliminary examinations, will entirely and solely be dependent on the statute, on the facts, on the evidence that I have. Because I am convinced, and I'm sure all of you here are convinced, that the minute I take political considerations as criteria for opening cases or closing cases or intervening, then we might as well just close the ICC and go. I think this will not work. This is not why the court was set up. And I, as prosecutor, will never take political considerations as what would make me intervene or not intervene. I am very resolute about that. And I think I've made it quite clear. But having, having said that, 
um, I just want to, um, uh, with due respect, uh, respond to the issues that have been raised by Judge Shui. Um, Judge Shui talks about the judges and the lawyers being from the West and that the defendants or the accused persons being from Africa. I am the prosecutor of the ICC. <laughs> And the last time I checked, I am from Africa. <laughs> you know, so, I, and this is what, uh, with greatest respect, this is what I mean when I say that we should look at the facts and criticize based on the facts. And this we, 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 we expect that um, those who are really concerned about human rights, they're concerned about stopping impunity on the continent, they're, they're concerned about giving justice to the victims. The victims, we have to remember, they are African victims. You know, all these people who are being killed, being raped, being displaced, being pillaged, they are African victims. This is what the court was set up to do, to protect these victims, not to protect the leaders who are perpetrating the crimes. This is why this court, that's, that's not why the court was set up. And I think we need assistance even from non-state parties. For instance, I know that China is a power economic house in Africa. And we have to remember, those of us who are from the court and are Africans, we care deeply about the continent. We do. We want it to be stable, we want it to be uh, secure, and we want that justice is done. Being an economic powerhouse in Africa, I think China can play a big role in ensuring that human rights are respected, that crime perpetrated on the continent is tried. Because when you talk, most of Africa listen. We listen. So I think this is something that you, you can help us to do. But coming back to this idea of this is what um, the West is doing, that the ICC is a tool in the hands of the West, that you know, only the defendants are from Africa. I don't need to go back to what I said earlier on. We all know how the cases came to, Africa, to, to ICC. We all know, unless you are saying that if Africa, an African state, needs the ICC and refers a case to the ICC, we should reject it because it's from Africa. If that is what you're saying, it's a different story. But I think that if an African state party needs the court, wants uh, the court to intervene, wants to ensure that there's no impunity on their territory, and a state party requests the intervention of the ICC, the court should be, go, go there based on the facts, on the evidence, and on the law. And I think this is what we have been doing. Under my watch, this is what we will continue to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, um, the judges and the prosecutor. I'm conscious, of course, of the time, so I'd like to ask Professor Jane Stormseth of uh, the Georgetown Law Center and the U.S. Department of State to give the closing uh, remarks. Jane? Thank you very much. I, I'd like to thank our distinguished panelists, first of all, for your public service, uh, for all that you do to advance justice and the peaceful settlement of disputes in a world that's so full of violent conflict. It's inspiring to see such exceptional lawyers and jurists, such exceptional women, uh, working day in and day out to apply international law to some of the worst and most difficult uh, challenges of the day. Um, as a professor of international law at Georgetown for over 20 years, I'm particularly pleased that Georgetown's Institute for Women, Peace, and Security is co-sponsoring this event. And I'd like to thank our panelists for the and our skilled moderator for the tour de force that really, I think, exposed us to some of the most interesting and thought-provoking issues in international justice. I, I'd like to just make two brief comments by, by way of conclusion. Uh, one about the, the architecture of, of uh, international justice and the, the sort of impact that was alluded to by several of the speakers. And second to the question that I often refer to as the challenge 
challenge of justice on the ground, the, the, the sort of role of reaching out and building domestic capacity and reaching out to those most affected um, at, the, at the local level. So I think, I think the discussion has made clear first that international courts are an essential part of the architecture of international peace and security. As we've talked about today, the ICJ and the ICC are part of a dynamic system that's evolving, that's developing. It also inclu includes an array of um, specialized international courts, regional courts. Uh, I'm thinking here, for example, of the um, European, Inter-American, and African human rights courts to sub-regional courts, including developing sub-regional courts in Africa. So we have, a, I think, a very interesting array of international and regional courts of which the two we've discussed today are a part. Uh, and as Judge Donahue put it, a, a lot of these courts can play a role in dialing back the temperature of conflicts and trying to resolve conflicts that, um, if, if left unaddressed, could um, erupt into armed conflict. And as, I think, as we all know, uh, armed conflicts are breeding grounds often for horrific atrocities. So there's a way in which all these courts, I think, can work together uh, in, in their own particular way to try to address conflict, to try to limit and minimize the chances of the most egregious um, international crimes. Uh, in, in the field of global criminal justice, which is the work of my current office at the State Department, uh, I think it's really remarkable if you look back over the last 20 years to see how the architecture of international criminal justice has developed. I mean, from the, uh, the ad hoc tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda to some of the mixed or hybrid courts like the Special Court for Sierra Leone, which brought together international and national judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, and administrators, to the establishment of the ICC, to some very innovative hybrid arrangements today that continue. Uh, it's really been remarkable to think about what's been developed in the last 20 years um, of our lives. And I think as the prosecutor so eloquently uh, stated, uh, these mechanisms and the law that they enforce um, provide a kind of shadow of the law that has a larger impact than even the individual cases that, that come before them. And uh, one, I think, very concrete example is the work of these courts to address um, the problem of sexual and gender-based violence, which disproportionately affects women and girls. And I think I, I'd like to personally commend the prosecutor for her commitment and her important work uh, in this area. If, if you look at the way in which these courts, these criminal courts, over the last 20 years have engaged on this issue, if you look at the way they've developed the law from the very early um, the very early law applied in the uh, Tokyo Tribunal, the provisions of the 1949 Geneva Conventions and Protocols to the, the jurisprudence of the Yugoslav and Rwanda Tribunal and the Special Court for Sierra Leone, uh, much of this incorporated into the uh, ICC statute, we now have a body of law that uh, recognizes as, um, as crimes not only rape, but also enforced prostitution, sexual slavery, forced pregnancy, forced marriage, and other forms of sexual violence as distinct crimes. So I think just the development of the law and the development of courts to enforce it is just a very tangible example of, of this, this important uh, impact of the these courts, um, but of course, there's a lot of work to be done in enforcing this, this body of law um, and protecting the victims of these uh, horrible forms of violence. And that brings me to my second point, um, which is that fair and effective national justice systems are also crucial to peace and security. You know, building the capacity of domestic judiciaries to provide accountability for atrocity crimes, for example, is a critical component of the global justice system. And as the prosecutor said, although the ICC plays an important role in this system, uh, the principle of complementarity at the heart of the Rome Statute recognizes that states uh, have the primary role uh, and they should be encouraged to genuinely investigate and prosecute uh, these worst uh, uh, international crimes. And, and when domestic justice works, 
uh, it demonstrates uh, powerfully uh, at the at the local and national level, uh, and and bears witness to the less, lesson that grave international crimes carry consequences. So there are many many opportunities, and some of them have been discussed here today, for states and NGOs to work together with national authorities uh, to strengthen domestic justice systems across a whole host of areas, from uh, forensic investigations, witness protection, educating prosecutors, judges and defense attorneys um, on international criminal law and due process principles. And I think there are many opportunities for innovative mixed forms of courts. Uh, the Special Court for Sierra Leone was one of those. There's a proposal now for a mixed chambers in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which would be in the national justice system, but with some amount of international participation. Uh, so there are many different innovative uh, kinds of tribunals that can be established. Um, but building some capacity within domestic justice systems, I think, will be critically important uh, to uh, bolstering peace and security uh, in the years ahead and to preventing uh, egregious uh, international crimes. And let me just mention one particular example where my office has been involved in providing support, and those are the mobile courts in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, where domestic, these are domestic courts that have international assistance that travel to remote areas uh, and uh, hold sessions where cases are heard against Congolese soldiers and armed groups uh, for war crimes and crimes against humanity with most trials involving charges of rape and sexual violence. So this is an example of what I call supply side capacity building that is such an important part of um, international criminal justice. But also crucial, and here I was pleased to see a number of the questioners raise this, is what I would call demand side capacity building, um, outreach to effect communities, right? Strengthening public understanding of their rights and of judicial remedies. And, and in this regard, it's especially important that victims and aggrieved and vulnerable populations see that justice is being done. And I, I would like to commend the Special Court for Sierra Leone for their, I think, very ambitious outreach program that traveled throughout the country, engaging the population, talking about you know, the tough issues of justice, because often these courts try only a small number of perpetrators. And you know, the victims see a lot of people who are never brought to justice. And so engaging in these outreach programs that really grapple with these difficult issues, I think, is a very important part of the project of international uh, criminal justice. And I think here we can learn from Eleanor Roosevelt, who is one of my personal heroes and a leader in developing the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights. Uh, she stressed the importance of education. And she stressed the, that the protection of human rights begins with communities. Right? It begins with changing the hearts and minds of individuals, working in their communities. She said in the small places where you know, rights are protected, where, where um, people learn about what's, what's truly important uh, in, in life. Uh, and as a professional educator, I, I believe education about rights is power. Uh, and I think education about international justice is empowering. So I'd like to thank the panelists today for their very learned um, uh, discussion. I think we've all benefited from, from hearing from them. And I'd like to um, commend them for their, their contribution to um, international justice uh, and, and for their important and tireless work. So thank you very much. Thank you.